Thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending your Son into a world of darkness, into a world uh, polluted with sin. We thank you, Lord. The solution to our sin problem is your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you for the incarnate Word who went on to bear our sins on the cross, to pay the penalty in full so that we can have eternal life through faith in him. Father, I pray, Lord, that we might rejoice, rejoice at your word, rejoice at the indescribable gift of your son. And Father, we pray that we might honor him and honor that son. We know the son who came in the first coming is coming for the church and then he will come to establish his righteous kingdom upon the earth and with in which justice and righteousness will prevail we look forward to that coming day father in the meantime help us to be lights in a dark place help us to lift forth the word of life lift forth the gospel and uh, illuminate uh, this dark place father i pray that we might take in the word of god by faith and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're dealing with uh, Balaam's prophecy, this obscure prophet uh, in the book of Numbers, prophesied of the coming Messiah. And uh, let's begin with Balaam's third prophecy back in the book of Numbers. Numbers 23, verse 37. Numbers 23. Let's take a look. Well, 27. Numbers 23, 27. Then Balak said to Balaam, Please come, I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me there. So Balaam, Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor that overlooks the wasteland. Now as we study the prophet of Balaam, we see that there were several locations in which he tried to curse the people of Israel. The children of Israel were assembled in here the plain of around the Jordan River, plain, plains of Moab, and they were camped here, and there's these three mountain peaks in which Balaam attempted to curse God's people whom he had blessed. And as we studied last week, the Abrahamic covenant is behind this incident. God indicated that he would bless the nation and because of his covenant promises and his faithfulness. And then that phrase in uh, Genesis 12, 3, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now think about that. That part of the Abrahamic covenant is brought out by Balaam's prophecy through that coming star, that coming Messiah. All the nations of the earth will be eventually be blessed through the coming Messiah, certainly. So... These are the locations here. Mount Peor is the location of the final prophecies of Balaam. And so he's looking over the children of Israel. And we will see in his fourth prophecy, we'll see in a minute, that he prophesies of the coming star. And uh, Matthew, or Numbers 24, 7, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult. So Balaam ultimately prophesied of a coming ruler, a king, coming from Israel that will defeat Israel's enemies. And as we know, that star is the Messiah. We'll tie that into the Magi visit in Matthew chapter 2. But uh, Balaam foresaw that day of the coming star, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's finish his prophecy here then. Let's go back to Numbers so he's on top of Peor, and that overlooks the wasteland. The wasteland is the Negev, the actual area where Jesus was tempted later in the Gospels. Uh, this is a barren land just on the other side of the Dead Sea. He had a high vantage point uh, looking over the children of Israel. Uh, we examine the fact that he built altars there, probably here not to honor the Lord in this sense, but a part of a pagan practice and to... Um, a, to find favor before the gods that uh, uh, were prominent in Moab. 
And then for chapter 24, verse 1, when Balaam saw that please the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go at other times. Now, at other attempts uh, to curse Israel, he tried to use sorcery, but this time he doesn't. It's interesting. When we come to the prophecies about the Messiah, this time these prophecies are given by the Holy Spirit. And um, he did not try to use sorcery, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And the Spirit of God came upon him as God's Spirit came upon other prophets later on in the Old Testament. Verse 2, Balaam raised up his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes. That's very interesting. As we saw in that first um, uh, PowerPoint, we saw the, and I like this map because we have the shape of a cross and how the nation of Israel were assembled. And... Uh, I don't know if he could see that from that high vantage point looking down upon the assembled tribes of Israel. He may have not known the significance, certainly, of that, uh, but he saw them assembled there uh, in the plains. So the Spirit of God came upon him, and he took up an oracle. So here is his prophecy. The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of a man whose eyes are open and the idea of a spiritual illumination here. The utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with his eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. Again, instead of cursing God's people, what came out of his mouth was a blessing, a blessing. Like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the water. He shall pour waters from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. And as we exam examined last week, it's like an individual carrying two buckets of water to the brim, and it spills over. This picture is a bounty of the Lord. Um, we have the Psalm 23, my cup runneth over. <laughs> so the blessings are abundant. He pictures Israel as being blessed being blessed and also the idea of the blessings that come from Israel affect other nations and spill over from Israel his seed shall be in many waters now um, the translation here the net Bible has this their descendants will be abundant be like abundant water the descendants of Israel will be like abundant water you remember in the Abrahamic covenant, God promised the descendants of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be like the stars in the sky, and numerous, and many, and then also by the, like the sand by the seashore, abundant. Here we have a third image of the abundance of Israel's posterity. They will be like many waters, like abundant waters. So God's going to prosper the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His king shall be higher than Agag. And we looked at that last week. Now, the um, Greek translation of the Old Testament has Gog. It's interesting. Gog is a future enemy of the nation of Israel in Ezekiel. And pictures, you know, uh, satanic rebellion against the Lord. And so the idea is the greatest king now... We know that Agog later was a historical king. Agag later was a historical king in the days of the kings. But ultimately, the idea is this king will be greater than any enemy of Israel. Uh, his king shall be greater than any enemy of Israel. And his kingdom shall be exalted. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 19 is called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Above all earthly kings, above all earthly authorities, the Lord Jesus Christ will reign. God brings him out of Egypt. His strength is like a wild ox. Now, um, what's interesting here, when we look at Numbers 23-22, so let's look back at that text in Numbers 23. The, let's see, go back to the prior chapter. We have almost an identical prophecy, but the one referred to is different. Numbers 23, 22, there it is. 
here uh, he speaks of a shout of the king is among among them. Now this is referring to Messiah as well. Uh, Unger says this because Messiah King will one day rule over the restored nation. Balaam declares a shout of a king is among them. But then God brings them out of Egypt. Now who's the them? Well, the them is plural, and he refers to the nation. The nation was delivered out of Egypt and has strength like a wild ox. So uh, this prophecy, God brings them out of Egypt, speaks of Israel. But we have a change in the referent in the chapter 23. Uh, the uh, prophecy, or 24, the prophecy in, tr in chapter 24. Let's examine this. He says here in uh, verse 8, God brings him out of Egypt. Not them. Him out of Egypt. Now it shifts ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a singular in the Hebrew. Singular pronoun versus plural pronoun. So it's interesting. God brings him out of Egypt. Now, you remember Hosea 11, 1? When uh, Lord Jesus Christ came before, after the, let's fast forward to Matthew. Matthew's gospel, we know that Herod tried to kill the babies two years and younger. And what happened? Uh, Joseph and Mary fled where? To Egypt. Egypt. And then finally, after the death of Herod, they, what, returned back. And so typologically, like the nation of Israel, God brought the ultimate son, the Messiah, from Egypt in typology. So here, God brings him, singular, out of Egypt. So I think in typology, ultimately, Hosea 11.1 1 is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting, that is a... Messianic prophecy, the reference in Hosea refers to the nation of Israel, but ultimately the uh, Lord Jesus Christ is one who is brought forth out of Egypt. So his strength is like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with arrows. Ultimately, this will not be fulfilled until Christ's second coming. His second advent, he will come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, defeating all of Israel's enemies. And uh, therefore, um, he is the, that ultimate king. Now, so we have a translation in the Moody, the Moody Handbook of Messianic Prophecy. If you want a detailed study on all the prophecies in the Old Testament on the Messiah, this is a recent resource that's excellent. Um, called the Moody Handbook of Messianic Prophecy. And this is what uh, Seth uh, D. Postel says here. Waters will flow from his, Israel's buckets, and his seed will be by abundant water. His, Israel's king, will be greater than Agag. And his, the king's kingdom, will be exalted. God brought him, meaning the king, Singular, out of Egypt, out of Egypt. So this is a great messianic prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ who will defeat his enemies. Verse 9, he says, he bows down, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? Remember, Jesus Christ is called the lion out of the tribe of Judah in the book of Genesis. So this is yet another reference to the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Seth Postel says this, Numbers 24.9 lacks a reference to people, making clear that the focus of the third discourse is on an individual king rather than on the people of Israel as a whole. So he's focused upon the king that will come out of Israel like a lion. And let's take a look and compare it to almost an identical prophecy in Genesis 49. Look at Genesis chapter 49, verses 9 and 10. Genesis 49, verses 9 and 10. 
Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion. As a lion, who shall rouse him up? It sounds almost identical to what Balaam is saying here. Then he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And that's the idea of the right to rule. The scepter of the king represents the right to rule, his authority, kingly authority. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet, a descendant will come from Judah. Until Shiloh comes. Now, what is that? The word Shiloh means the one to whom it belongs. And so, to whom belongs the scepter, the right to rule? A future descendant of Judah. And we know that that's the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why does the Gospel of Matthew open up with the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ? To show that he is in the Messianic line of Judah. He is a descendant of Abraham and David, and he's qualified to fulfill those covenant promises. It's very important. So this right, the rule, shall not depart from Judah until the one to whom it belongs. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, ultimately, the Messiah was rejected in his first coming, but in the second coming, the nation of Israel will look unto him whom they have pierced. And so Israel will look to their Messiah and Messiah will rule over the nation of Israel and over all the kingdoms of the world and his coming messianic kingdom. So you see that Balaam's prophecy is very similar to this prophecy in the book of Genesis of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back here to the text here in um, Numbers. So, we see clearly that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, the, will be the one who will come forth from the uh, Judah, and he is the one who will defeat Israel's enemies, as we saw in verse 8. And then verse 9, part B, he said, Blessed is he who blesses you, and curses is he who curses you. Now think about that. Uh, again, repeating the Abrahamic covenant promise. Now, ultimately, this refers to the Messiah. Certainly, the nation of Israel is included in this, blesses he who blesses you, but ultimately, that is true of the Messiah as well. We need to honor and bless the Messiah, but if we turn against him, curses is he who curses you. So, the Messiah will come then. Now, Verse 10, Balaam's anger was aroused against Balaam, the one who tried to pay him off to uh, curse God's people. He struck his hands together, and Balaam said to Balaam, he probably, the idea of striking his hand together, you know, he probably did it out of anger, <laughs> and he was very upset, and he was going to send him away because he did not do the job he was sent to do. <laughs> And I'm glad he didn't. <laughs> it's amazing who God uses uh, to speak his truth. And uh, here Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Therefore, flee to your place. Go home. <laughs> Go home. And uh, he said, I would greatly, I great, would have greatly honored you. I would have paid you uh, a, a great amount. But in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. Oh, really? Now that sounds real spiritual, doesn't it? <laughs> you do what God doesn't want you to do, and the Lord's the reason why you're not blessed. No, he is in rebellion against the Lord. <laughs> and if he honors the Lord, God will honor him. So Balaam said to Balak, did I not also speak to you, messengers? Did I not also speak to your messengers, whom you sent me to say, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad on my own will. What the Lord says, that I must speak. And now indeed I'm going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. Now it's interesting. He's looking forward to the end times. And we will see in the latter days the arise of the star 
uh, the Messianic star in verse 15. So he took up the oracle and said, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor. So here is Balaam's fourth prophecy, the utterance of a man whose eyes are opened, illuminated by the Spirit of God, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and has a knowledge of El Elyon. This is used by the book of Daniel, the Almighty, the possessor of heaven and earth. I'm speaking under his authority, God Almighty who sees a vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. Here it is, this great prophecy. It's a small, obscure prophecy that, you know, many people, I'm sure, when reading through the book of Numbers, if they read the book of Numbers at all, <laughs> skip over. But let's not miss it. I see him, but not now, showing that this prophecy is in the remote future. It is in the future. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And this is the ultimate star, as we've seen in this depiction here. He sees this star, which is symbolic, certainly, of a future ruler or king. And that ruler or king is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate fulfiller of that. Now, it's interesting that Balaam lived in the uh, Mesopotamia region, and later on, Daniel would minister hundreds of years later and speak of that Messiah yet again, 600 years before the birth of Christ, and speak about successive world empires that would arise, and eventually a stone cut without hands that will defeat those Gentile enemies and reign over all the earth in Daniel 2. And ultimately, that information was conveyed to the Magi, the wise men who came to visit Jesus, who saw a star. And more than likely, uh, he, they probably understood clearly concerning this prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Matthew, by the way, we'll look at that text in a minute, it's called his star. Not any star, but his star. The star of the Messiah. And I think Implied in that text would be Balaam's prophecy, certainly, of the coming Messiah would be a star that will come out of Jacob, a ruler who will defeat Israel's enemies. So Jesus Christ is that star that will arise out of Jacob. Now, I have a couple uh, comments on here. Revelation twenty two sixteen. Revelation twenty two sixteen identifies Jesus as the bride and morning star. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, meaning I'm the messianic descendant. Understand this, he taught John the apostle, ties this prophecy in with the Davidic covenant. Remember, God promised David an everlasting descendant. And therefore, that prepares a way for a future messianic kingdom. He is both David's root and offspring. He is both God and man. He is the root of David, and he's the offspring of David. How can he be both? Well, he's God and man. And therefore, he is the fulfiller of those Davidic covenant promises. He's also called the what? The bright and morning star. So the Lord Jesus Christ is identified as the star. He is that future ruler that will rule over his people. And um, let's go back here to second uh, note here. I want to take a look at this concerning this great messianic prophecy. This is by Arnold Frutenbaum. Uh, Arnold Frutenbaum makes an interesting comment. This is not a literal star because it says concerning this star, a scepter shall rise from Israel. The star and the scepter are one and the same. Remember that the term scepter is a symbol of royalty or kingship. This star which would arise out of Jacob is himself a king. Further, Balaam's occupation was that of astrology. Even more significant, he came from the city of Pethor, a city on the banks of the Euphrates River in Babylonia. 
So he ties us in, I think, later, connects the connection later on with Daniel's prophecy from that same region. And then the Magi coming, seeking this ruler from the east. And that east, by the way, is Babylonia from the land of Israel. It would be the area east of, of the land of Israel, the land of Babylon. And that's where the kings came from. Um, so we have here, again, the uh, promise here of Balaam. Balaam, it indicates, Numbers 23, verse 4, indicates he came from Mesopotamia, that fertile crescent region. And therefore, uh, he is the one who probably conveyed this information uh, down through the ages uh, to those in that area. And I think the Magi was probably looking for that uh, coming Messiah, that star that would arise out of Jacob. This individual star will defeat Moab and Israel's enemies, the batter to brow of Moab, destroy the sons of Tumont. And then all these various enemies of Israel, you won't get into verse 18 through the end of the chapter, but these are enemies of the nation of Israel that will be uh, defeated. And therefore, uh, no nation will stand against God's people. And Messiah will defend Israel once again in the future. He will defend them. And he will bring in his righteous kingdom. And the nations will be uh, bowing, will come, will come to, the, to the city of Jerusalem, just like the Magi did in the first coming, the second coming, Song 72 indicates that kings will bring presents in his second coming. Let's just take a look at that, Song 72. This is a song many ascribe to King Solomon, who was Israel's greatest king. Notice in 72, a song of Solomon, but Solomon speaks of the ultimate king of kings and lord of lords and this messianic prophecy. In Psalm 72, and uh, let's go down further. Uh, verse 7, In his days the righteous shall flourish in the abundance of peace until the moon is no more. He shall have dominion from sea to sea. Now again, sea to sea would be the city of Jerusalem is between two seas. It's between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. So the land of Israel, the boundaries of the land of Israel. And then the river, which would be the northern boundary of Israel, that would be the Euphrates River. But it doesn't stop there. His dominion is not only over Israel, but over all the earth, to the ends of the earth. Those who dwell in the wilderness will bow before him. His enemies will lick the dust. They'll plant their face on the ground before him, bowing down to the king of kings and lord of lords. Even kings from Spain, the kings of Tarshish and the Isles, the furthest known regions there in the Mediterranean, all the way before you go out into the ocean, those kings from those remote regions will one day come and will do what? Look at verse 10. Will bring presents. Will bring presents, gifts. The kings of Sheba and Seba, you know, the queen of Sheba who visited Solomon and her glory. In, in his glory, and they will offer, do what? Will offer gifts. See that verse 10, will offer gifts. This is not a prophecy of the Magi. This is ultimately a prophecy when Messiah reigns over all the nations from the city of Jerusalem. It's interesting. So the, as the kings came in his first coming presenting gold, silk, frankincense, and myrrh, in the second coming, there'll be kings that will come when Christ finally reigns over all the earth. And yes, verse 11, all kings shall fall down before him. Not just the Magi. Now, there are certain kings that fell down before him, but certainly King Herod did not. <laughs> we see other kings who did not. Um, and they did not recognize the king of kings and lord of lords, but one day he will be recognized as such. As a matter of fact, in Philippians 2, it says, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're not there yet, but that day is coming. That day is coming. All kings shall fall down before him, 
and all nations shall serve him. Who? The King of kings and Lord of lords. So we have this amazing prophecy then of Balaam. Let's take a look then. I want to examine Matthew chapter 2. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. And here we have the well-known account of the birth of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have the Magi from the east visiting the babe in the manger, or the babe here in the house. <laughs> and Luke deals with the babe in the manger, but these wise men come a little later uh, when Jesus is in the house. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, by the way, we can date when King Herod died, and therefore we can date around the time of when Messiah came. And he died somewhere around 4 B.C. I know that sounds strange because you think A.D. B.C., before Christ, right? But uh, we have a Latin expression there. I won't get into the details of our, our uh, how we view chronology there, but it comes out to around 4 B.C., um, so we can date the appearance of when the Messiah, Harold Honer, by the way, uh, he has, I think, a really phenomenal book, uh, Chronological Aspects of Life of Christ. Little red book, real thin, but he goes into Daniel 77 prophecy. I think he worked out the date to exactly the day. Other than Sir Robert Anderson, who first looked at Daniel's prophecy and uh, indicated the exact day. He had, I think, an A.D. 32 crucifixion. Harold Honer went back and revised some of the numbers, but it came out exactly to an A.D. 33 crucifixion. I go with Harold Honer. He's, he taught uh, at Dallas Theological Seminary. He was a New Testament professor. He wrote probably the mo one of the most exhaustive commentaries on the book of Ephesians. I have it in there. It's a huge volume just on the five chapters of Ephesians. This guy was a scholar. But his numbers, I believe, are spot on in his chronology. So I go with his chronology, New Testament chronology. And uh, here, let's go back here then to the text. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Where did, he get, where did they get that concept? <laughs> From the Old Testament, <coughs> clearly from the Old Testament. Uh, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Um, now, obviously, where would be the natural place to go to uh, to inquire? The capital city of Jerusalem, certainly. And also, the Old Testament indicates that Messiah will reign from the city of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem would be the natural place to look for the king. And so he's inquired, but they inquired exactly, and and more precisely, where would that king be born? Well, that king would be born in a little town of Bethlehem. <laughs> Bethlehem Ephrata. There's two Bethlehems in the Bible. That's why we have the one distinguished in Malachi as the small town of Bethlehem. And uh, so let's take a look at verse 2, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star. Notice, not a star. We have seen his star in the east. Very significant. You'll ask, well, what is that star? Well, we'll take a look at some options here this morning. What is that star? We have seen his star in the east and have come to do what? Worship him. Worship him. Worship a king. Yeah, this one is a unique king. And God is the one who has right to worship. Remember, later... In, uh, when Satan tempts Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, just turn your Bibles forward to Matthew chapter 4, in verse 8, Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. Wow, that's virtual reality. <laughs> Imagine that, just a flash, the ability. Here's all the king, future kingdoms in their glory, the greatness of these kingdoms. Um, and notice here in verse 9, he said to him, all these things I will give you who fall down and worship me. 
I'm going to give you authority over these kingdoms. Now, it's not Satan's right to do that. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24. Uh, God is the possessor of heaven and earth. He is the most high God, El Elyon, the one who created it. He has the right to give it to his son. His son is the heir, heir apparent in Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2, 8, Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. That song indicated that the Messiah, the kingdoms will be given from not Satan, but the Father. And therefore, he said to him, Away with you, Satan, verse 10, for it is written, you shall worship the who? You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him you shall serve. You shall only worship the Lord God. So when the Magi came to worship him, they recognized, I think, further that this one, this Messianic king, was deity. Deity. So we're going to worship this babe in the manger because he is deity. Now, the Magi remained ignatic in ignatic figures, but were probably wise men specializing in astronomy and astrology, almost similar to Balaam, right? Almost similar in nature to Balaam. Now, Daniel chapter 2, let's take a look at this passage. And I did a search uh, in the Septuagint. Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And the word uh, magi is used in the book of Daniel, in a sense. Daniel chapter 2 in the Septuagint. Then the kings gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king, the magi. So there were magi, wise individuals who studied astrology, astronomy. Um, they combined the two, really. Um, and uh, they tried to interpret Daniel's dream. Daniel chapter 2, verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. There's no king, lord, or ruler who ever asked such things of any magician. There it is, the word there, magi. Astrologers or Chaldean. And then verse 14, with the counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered, and he indicates uh, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Notice wise men. So their exact same word is used of these wise men in the area of Babylon. So I think this is the origination of these wise men. I think they came from Babylon. They came from Babylon. And Daniel prophesied of the coming king. He prophesied the coming Messiah. Balaam prophesied of that ruler that will come. And therefore, keep in mind that when, when Matthew opens up his gospel in that period of time, there was a Jewish community in Babylon. The Jews were deported to Babylon. What would they bring with them? They would bring with them the Old Testament scriptures. And I thought, not just the book, I was thinking this week, not just the book of Daniel, but the book of Zechariah. Uh, you know, the whole Old Testament they would bring, the book of Numbers. They would have the Old Testament scriptures. Now, that doesn't mean that, certainly in Daniel's day, they did not recognize uh, that Jesus is the Lord and uh, that God is the one. They worship many gods, but I think there was the knowledge available to them. And I, by the way, anyone who's positive to the teaching of God in his truth, God will reveal himself, I think. If anyone will, he shall know the doctrine, no matter what country, nation you're from. If you desire a relationship with God, I think God will direct you to the truth. He's not going to leave you in the dark. If you really want the truth, God will direct you to the truth. So certainly we have the knowledge of the word of God, at least, that these um, magi probably studied and they were looking for this messianic king. Now, from the east could be Egypt, but more likely Babylonia, where a large and influential group of Jews still lived in exile. So the, there was a large Jewish remnant in Babylon still in Matthew's day. In Matthew's day. 
it is remotely possible that those magi were familiar with the prophecies of Daniel and that these, in association with the star, Balaam's prophecy, would have caused them to come to the Holy Land. So that's what motivated them to come and worship him. What was a star? Now let's talk about that. What was a star? Now, okay, we have basically two categories. The star was a natural phenomenon. Number two, it was a supernatural phenomenon. Okay? You have two choices. And then categories, subcategories from those two choices. Now, some say, well, the star was, let's talk about the natural explanation, Jupiter and Saturn. They were aligned in Pisces, constellation Pisces in 7 BC. But such planetary alignment were never called stars. That's neat when you see planets coming together, what's called a conjunction. I've seen several when they come together, close together. Uh, we had one with, uh, I think, Venus and Jupiter, the two brightest planets visible came together. Um, but this was not a conjunction. All right, Haley's Comet. Some say what's a comet. We sing a Christmas hymn that has this theory. With a tail as big as a kite, <laughs> right? So what that what is that song implying? They fall with a comet, right? When a comet has a big tail. And uh, usually if you know anything about comets, um, you're not shooting star. People think a comet's a, wow, so shoot. That's not a comet. That's a meteorite. That's not a comet. Comet appears... And close to the sun, and when, that's when it gets its tail, by the way, when it approaches the sun, and the, the, the uh, sun has that solar wind that blows back, and we can see from our vantage point the tail of a comet. So usually you only see a long tail on it, comet, when it gets close, close to the sun, meaning that you'll see it toward the dawn or in the evening. So you only see that, that effect in the morning or in the evening. Uh, is the phenomenon of that. Now, here we have a Halley's Comet as suggested, but that was too early. It, was, it appeared in 12 BC. I remember I was around, and that's when I bought my telescope, by the way, in 86, I was it. Halley's Comet came around right then um, and uh, viewed Halley's Comet, uh, but that wasn't Halley's Comet. Uh, this star appeared uh, in 27, suggested it had never been documented previously. It appeared. 29 implies that the star moved around, supporting a supernatural origin, and many parallel the pillar of fire that led the Hebrews in the wilderness. Now, when we look at this, we need to observe what the text says and what it doesn't say. I think this is where we are misguided. The text does not say that they followed the star all the way from Babylon. Where does it say that in the text? This is pop, pop, popular in our Christmas songs or, you know, uh, the idea that they followed the star all the way from Babylon. No, they saw in Babylon a star. It reappeared when they were in Jerusalem. Now, let's take a look at the text. <laughs> So going back to Matthew, observe what it doesn't say. Uh, we read into the Christmas story things that are part of popular culture. Um, but Matthew 2, he says, verse 2, he, we have seen his star where? Now, these wise men, where were they at this point? They were in Jerusalem. They simply say, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Right? Uh, doesn't say that they followed that star from Babylon. It says they simply saw a star in Babylon. And as a result of that, they headed toward the land of Israel. Now, if you're going to have king of the Jews, where will you go to see the Jewish king? The land of Israel, right? That's where you would head, naturally. Uh, so there was no guesswork and where to go. They knew where Jerusalem was. Now, if you look at the Fertile Crescent, I think Babylon somewhere, what, 800 to 1,100 miles from the land of Israel, somewhere in that range. Um, and therefore, that journey could have taken maybe a month and a half. I was looking, estimating traveling 20 miles a day. Uh, that journey would take, you know, a month, month and a half maybe. Um, but notice here, let's read the text. 
When Herod the king, verse 3, heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. He, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Where is the Messiah? Where will he be born? They said, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, and this is the prophet Micah. But you, Bethlehem, the land of Judea, are not least among the rulers of Judah. Out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. When Herod had secretly called the wise men, determined from what time the star appeared. Notice he just indicates the timing of when it appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for the young child. And bring, and when you found him, bring him word to me that I might come and worship him also. That was a farce. <laughs> he did not want to worship this king. You have to keep in mind, Herod killed members of his own family. This guy was evil. This, any threat to his throne, uh, he would take out. Uh, he did not in the least want to worship uh, the king of kings. When, he heard, when they heard the king, they departed. And here it is. Here's the next mention of the star. Behold, the star which they had seen in the east now went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Only the leading that the text describes is a leading from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. They followed from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And by the way, that's only, what, eight miles? If you look at Bethlehem's not far from Jerusalem. Um, I have to look at that again. It's been a long time since I've you know, looked at the mileage, but it's not very far away. Um, so they followed it. But the unique thing about this star, whatever it is, we'll look at some options, whatever this star is, it guided them to not only the town of Bethlehem, but the very place where Messiah was. No natural phenomenon can do that. It doesn't work that way. If you know anything about astronomy, it doesn't work that way. Um, so to me, this indicates that this star was something supernatural. Supernatural. Okay, let's take a look at the natural explanations first. So the star uh, in 2.7 suggested it had not been documented previously. 2.9 implied that the star moved around. That doesn't happen. Now, the earth rotates through the night, and they move, but, you know, it's not going to guide you to a specific house or a specific location. Stars do not do that. Uh, they implied the star moved around, supporting a supernatural or origin, may parallel the pillar of fire that led the Hebrews in the wilderness. So we have the brightness. So we come to, by the way, J. Dwight Pentecost. Remember reading his um, commentary on the Gospels? And he indicated that he thought, and I tend to agree with J. Dwight on this, that the star was the Shekinah glory of God. It was supernatural because the same glory of God led the children of Israel through the wilderness, pillar of cloud by pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And the word star means simply something bright or shining. Okay? It's not a technical term per se for a physical star. Certainly, uh, it can represent individuals or people, and I think that's the case with Balaam's prophecy. It represents a king. But it, it, here, it's something supernatural. And so, uh, I was reading, by the way, it's interesting, Henry Morris, and I have great respect for Henry Morris. Henry Morris, though, held to a, and I think out of the natural explanations for the star, he probably had the best one if you were going with the natural route. He said it was a supernova. So I think he said, now I can understand that that's possible. In a certain constellation, a supernova that never appeared before will explode, and it's a bright star that the wise men saw, saw originally. But my problem is, they saw the same thing again and followed it to the house. That's where that natural explanation breaks down. And so I think the supernatural explanation fits better. The Shekinah glory of God guiding them to exactly the place. So they knew exactly to look for a star which represents a king, the brightness that appeared 
they had notified them that it's time to go. Now, uh, let's see who this is here. This is Pentecost, the words and works of Jesus Christ. He said this, there seems to be a parallel in the case of Abraham. Abraham was a wise, powerful man from the east to whom God appeared and revealed his glory. Think about that. God appeared to Abraham and revealed his glory. Therefore, this revelation of God's glory moved Abraham out of his home and country. Let's look at Acts 7 2. Stephen recounts this. The first church's martyr. Uh, Stephen uh, is recalling scripture out of the Old Testament in uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 2. Uh, he said, brethren and fathers, listen, the, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mes Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. The God of glory appeared to him. And so what did Abraham do? Abraham moved out of his country and headed toward the land of Israel. It's an interesting parallel there. Uh, so these wise men are coming, are being guided by the Lord. Um, it would have been impossible for a confluence of stars to single out an individual dwelling place in the village of Bethlehem. It would have been impossible for a confluence of star to do that, as Dr. Pentecost states. All right. After having lost sight of the star, they traveled to the logical place where a Jewish king would be found. Where would that be? The capital city of Israel, Jerusalem. That would be the logical place to go. Uh, it doesn't say the star led them there. They saw the star in the east, and then they headed out to where that king would be born. Uh, the Judean king, more than likely, in Jerusalem. Um, since there was a Jewish community, the Magi in Babylon would have had the Old Testament scriptures. Zechariah, by the way, indicates uh, that the nations in the future second coming will come to Jerusalem and worship before the king. Now, thinking about that prophecy, they may have had this prophecy in mind, Zechariah 14. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 14 and let's look at uh, verse 16 and 17. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. We have come to worship who? The king of the Jews. Where? Jerusalem. Zechariah prophesied of that location and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So in the future millennial kingdom, the nations will come to Jerusalem to worship the king. The king. We saw that in Psalm 72. Psalm 72. They'll bring presents <laughs> and worship him. Uh, Daniel's prophecy Dan of Daniel 2.44, which is a reference of that future stone, that ultimate kingdom, which will de demolish all Gentile kings and kingdoms. Then the prophecy in Daniel 9. Uh, Daniel 9 certainly indicated the timing of when the Messiah would appear. Now, although the birth of Christ is not mentioned in Daniel 77, it does picture the arrival of the Messiah. So they knew they were getting close, I think, at that point. So Daniel 77 points to the exact day when Messiah would come in Jerusalem as a king and present himself as king of kings and lord of lords. Obviously, they were 30 years earlier before that period of time, but they know that, well, if he's going to be an adult, let's backtrack and say this is about the time to start looking for that messianic king. They could have Daniel's prophecy, Daniel 9, in mind. So there are a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament, I think, that would lead the Magi to an understanding of a king coming, being born, uh, to rule over his people. Now, let's talk about when the Magi appeared. And uh, we have five minutes. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> wish I had another hour. But um, we want to present here, it's interesting, we've always heard that, well, since Herod killed the children two years and younger, these Magi appeared two years later. Not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. You have to rethink, you know, what, what you've been taught. Uh, some argue that, well, 
Obviously, a location's different. We have in Luke uh, the manger. There the shepherds appeared, uh, whereas a house is mentioned in Matthew. Correct. I would say that's right. That's right. Uh, but it wouldn't take very long to go from a manger to a house. They can't stay in a manger forever. <laughs> uh, you would move to a house uh, pretty quickly. All right. Now, what I'm not saying is what we see commonly in our manger scene, we see the shepherds and, you know, the uh, magi together. I don't think that happened. I don't think that happened. That's our nice Christmas, Christmas cards, but, uh, you know, we have both of them appearing together. But I do also, but I, what, what I am saying is, I'm saying that the magi appeared not long after. I don't think they waited two years. I think the Magi, as soon as they saw the star, they headed maybe a month later, maybe a month and a half later, they were there. They were there. Um, now, some try to argue the two different Greek words. So individuals who know a little Greek, I remember I visited uh, Spiros Zodiates, who has a Hebrew-Greek key study Bible. And he says, he's a short guy, by the way, he says, I know a little Greek. <laughs> that's, a, that's an old joke here with his wife. I know a little Greek. But um, individuals know a little Greek but haven't really done a thorough word study come to this conclusion. Well, we see uh, that the word uh, young child, uh, paideon, is used in Luke 2, 17 and 21, which means a, a newborn child, an infant. And they say, or the word brephos, excuse me, the word brephos is the one used in Luke, uh, the young child or infant. Whereas the word paideia means an older child. Not necessarily so. And I looked in BDAG. It's interesting that these two Greek words are interchangeable. Luke uses both of these to describe Jesus. Luke uses both of these Greek terms. Luke 2.17. Let's look at Luke 2.17. Luke 2.17 and Luke 2.21. Now, when they seen him, they made widely known the saying that was told them concerning this child. See that? Now, just uh, go down to verse uh, 16, or that's the verse 16. Let's go back to verse 12. You will, you will, this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in the manger. I think that's the word brephos, a babe, an infant. But yet... That infant is a young child. It's interchangeable. So these two Greek words do not really mean, okay, the Magi came to a newborn babe. Now he's like two years old. Uh, that's not supported by the Greek necessarily, that distinction, because both terms are used by Luke. And we get into further word study that we want, we don't time. Now, Harold Hunter says this, furthermore, to say that Jesus is no longer an infant because the Magi visited him in a house rather than a stable, is quite weak. Certainly they would have moved to a house as soon as it was possible. Indeed, the tone of Matthew 2.1 is that the Magi visited Christ soon after his birth. That Herod killed children up to two years old was only to be sure he got Jesus. This is not out of character with Herod. Therefore, the slaying of the children soon after Christ's birth is tenable. Now, I came across another interesting verse in Revelation that may support this. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Revelation 12, 4. We see the angelic conflict in this passage in Revelation chapter 12. Satan originally in his fall drew a third of the angels, a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth, and the dragon, which represents Satan here, stood before the woman, that's Israel, uh, in who was re what ready to give birth. That means Christ in his first coming. So we have this angelic conflict, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent in the Old Testament. And now Satan's attempt to try to prevent the Messiah from coming has failed, final attempt. This dragon wants to devour her child, which is the Messiah, when? Look at these next few words. It's, it struck me when I saw this. As soon as it was born, Herod attempted to kill the children two years younger. He was motivated by Satan. As soon as a child was born, meaning it didn't take long. 
So imagine just even a month later, a month and a half, he didn't wait to, Satan did not wait two years to try to destroy, you know, that child. It was, he, he wanted, as soon as that child was born, he wanted that child killed. And so the Magi, I don't think, I don't think visited a couple years later. I think they were there maybe a month or two. And uh, that occurred shortly after. Okay. Now, the day of Christmas. <laughs> we're out of time. Uh, when is Christmas? Now, I have a, a good argument from Harold Honer that it's probably in, uh, around the time of year that we celebrate. Now, obviously, the date is not mentioned in the Bible. December 25th, that er, goes back to early church history. Some trace it to Christendom. But you know what? There's another early church father, Hippolytus, who set the date as December 25th. That was... 165 to 230, he lived 165 to 235, not long after the New Testament was given. Um, the argument for what time of year Christ was born, all right? Um, and, you know, shepherds abiding in the field at night uh, usually say, well, that's in the summer, that's not in the fall, winter, but Harold Honer makes a good argument that it's December or January. It's interesting. But uh, we're out of time. Maybe we'll pick that back up next week. All right, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the scripture. And certainly we enjoy this time of year when we do set aside a date, whether we know the exact date or not. We do set aside a date to think about the greatest gift given to man, the gift of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that indescribable gift. We thank you so much for the coming Messiah, the one who has arrived and the one who will one day come and rule in his righteous kingdom upon this earth. We pray that we might worship him and honor him. And we ask these things in Christ's name, amen.